Welcome to Exponential Chats, provided to you by Exponential Ventures. In this week's episode, we'll be talking about Microsoft's project codenamed Natick, which was an attempt of sustainably running a data center underwater. After two years of deployment, Microsoft is claiming that their servers were up to eight times more reliable than their counterparts on land. Is that an indication that the cloud is actually moving to the sea? My name is Adriano Marcus. I am the founder and CEO of Exponential Ventures, and today I have here with me Nathan Martins, Harley Vicente, and Fernando Camargo. Before we start our discussion, let's just briefly set the stage here. If the idea of the clouds somehow moving from the sky to the sea made you confused, don't worry. We're not talking about clouds in the sky, but rather the concept of cloud infrastructure for internet services going from land installations to underwater installations. Okay, I admit, even if you thought of the right cloud, this is probably still confusing. Why would anyone go through the trouble of trying to run computers 200 meters deep in the ocean? Let's break this down quickly. There are four single major infrastructural challenges when it comes to building data centers for the cloud. The first one is power. A typical data center will house tens of thousands of servers. The typical cloud data center will consume no less than 10 megawatts of power. That is enough energy to power about 6,500 average homes. And managing all that power is a big challenge. The second challenge is, therefore, heat. Computers generate a lot of it in the process of converting energy into computing activities. And the more date power a data center consumes, the more heat it generates. Unfortunately, computers are not able to reliably operate at high temperatures, which requires engineers to employ cooling solutions capable of keeping them cool. But there are no free lunches in the world of data center. When you turn on a giant air conditioner to cool off 10 megawatts worth of servers, you may end up requiring another 10 megawatts of power if your solution is particularly inefficient. The third challenge is space. All of those machines require a vast amount of real estate. And the AC not only is required to cool the equipment, it will also be required to cool the air inside the structure requiring more power and a bigger cooling system. The fourth challenge is people. These machines are bound to fail at some point, requiring a human to enter the data center to repair the equipment. If humans come in, they typically need oxygen to survive. And wherever oxygen is, there are two problems that follow, oxidation and fires. The community has discussed for years about True Lights Out data center solution, in which humans are never required to access the computers at any point but none of the proposed solutions were quite feasible or economically sound. Then came Microsoft with the idea of sinking the data center deep into the ocean to tap into the massive amount of cool water to decrease cooling power requirements and remove all oxygen from the inside of the data center, completely eliminating the risk of fires and increasing the lifespan of the servers by reducing oxidation. On its face, it seems that this is a crazy idea, but two months ago, Microsoft brought back to the surface a data center they sunk into the North Sea two years ago and left it running since then and compared the reliability of these servers against an identical data center they maintained on land. Amongst their findings, they learned that not only the underwater data center was more sustainable and faster to deploy, but it was up to eight times more reliable than its land counterpart, which prompted our team to ask, is the cloud moving to the sea? What's your opinion on this, Nathan? Um, hi, everyone. So my opinion is that I do believe the cloud is going not just to the sea, but we're seeing the, the, the break from a traditional structure where we have data centers in specific locations, and now we're bringing the information to where the users are. Like one of their main points that they brought was like, I think it was one third of the whole population of the earth lives around the coastal area. Um, so you got to put your data where um, the people are. That makes sense in an environmental kind of way, 
in an economical kind of way and just in like speeds, I guess. Um, like we're seeing a surge in cloud technology, not just like people running things in the cloud, but like I've seen recently examples of people trying to game on the cloud. So you can exam for if someone's running a game, they need very low latency. So being close to the data center where this is running will probably be beneficial. So in my opinion, um, even though it has a few challenges ahead, I think that's the future of data centers. Um, what do you think, Fernando? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, I myself have been playing video games for some time and definitely latency is one of the things that concerns us not only with video, video games but servers in general we usually need some low latencies to serve our users and stuff like that so definitely having the data set data centers near to the users will definitely help and in general uh, i think there are there will the, like in the article they have written, uh, they show the difference, the distance from most places that have some kind of civilization from the sea. It's not very large. It's not too distant. So definitely it would be a good solution, I think. But first, I think they have to really prove that it works, uh, how they will upgrade the systems, uh, do the maintenance and anything like that before people really start buying from them. What do you think, Harley? Oh, hello everyone. Well, we all know that uh, data centers are the future. Uh, everything, um, I mean, cloud is the future. Everything from a uh, uh, video game playing to processing of data. Some people, so, sometimes companies even have workstations being uh, run remotely and they just access from uh, a, a simple computer. So we all know that's where we're gonna go. And as more people start using the internet and need more services, data centers and servers in general are gonna be uh, a, a big point of um, a big limitation. We're gonna have to evolve them as much as we can. And uh, yes, uh, the sea seems like a good place to go for very obvious reasons. The biggest chunk of earth is water. The biggest part of it is water. And we will we'll, we'll eventually run out of space and water is as good as any place to try and uh, as long as we get the technology prop uh, properly and, and test it out, make sure that we're not gonna have pr tr trouble with the structure and uh, also make sure that we're not gonna affect the underwater habitats. It sounds like a great idea and I do believe this will happen uh, and it shouldn't take too long. Interesting. So I, I, I agree for the most part. I think um, it's a great idea to tap into all of that cooling power that the ocean can offer. Um, it is readily available. You don't actually run the ocean water through the servers in order to cool the system. You have heat exchangers that are placed around or outside of the structure. And then you have a, a separate channel that runs through those exchangers that runs the liquid that actually cools the servers inside um, or the air inside the, the container. It just depends on the technology they are using. So I just wanted to first clarify that we're not in any way producing with this kind of solution, any byproducts or contaminating the water or just having water with um, sea life coming into contact with the servers in any form uh, or way. Um, it is particularly interesting because um, Microsoft is not doing this just for the sake of saving with uh, acreage or real estate. Um, they've been thinking of harnessing not only the cooling power of the ocean, but also the power of generating energy and run those data centers in a completely sustainable way. So in theory, you could have one pod with 12 of those uh, data centers in a tube that they, they recovered and in a, in a large pod sunk into the ocean and powered by uh, wind turbines right above it floating or uh, tide uh, generators where they use the, the ocean tide to generate water. And, and those are essentially, it, they come in many shapes and forms, but most of them are just essentially a buoy that stays in the surface 
but because they are bobbing up and down constantly, they use this energy to turn a generator and generate power. So if you think about it, is there a time when the ocean is gonna stop bobbing that uh, buoy? No, and there is no wasted byproduct, and it's a very efficient way of generating power. Um, and you have no loss in transmission because you're providing all of that power right there and then to a data center located within a few meters of the, the generator. So go ahead, Harley. Are we able to uh, generate enough power? Because as you've mentioned, uh, there's a lot of power cons consumed in these data centers. Are we able to reliably generate the power from the wind? And if we do, wind, wind is not constant. We might need a backup power, I'm assuming. And then would we, ha would we have to resort to running a, an actual cable, a power cable to this uh, location? If, if what, what, would that were the case, wouldn't that uh, beat the purpose? Well, so uh, not necessarily. Most data centers, they, they come with their own backup power. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't rely on this alone to power your data center. In fact, uh, data centers, they're classified in tiers. And if I remember correctly, there are four tiers. And in the fourth, tiers, fourth tier, you typically have enough redundancy such that you can actually have the failure of multiple components and you still have enough backups. So say, for example, you're, you, you, you have a data center that runs, uh, requires 10 megawatts of power uh, to run. So you would have the source from the, the power company, your local power company, and perhaps you have two different sources coming in. And then you have um, at least three generators with the same capacity in standby. Right next to the servers, you also have UPS units that carry the load until the generators kickstart and recover from an outage. So if, if, if power goes down from one power provider, then it resorts to the next one and the switch is seamless because again, we have those uh, battery packs to provide uninterruptible uh, power supply. And if both of them fail, then it resorts to the battery until the generator turns on and, and get up to speed. And then it switches back on just to the generator. If that generator fails, then it follows to the next one and then the next one. So that's what we call the six nines re uh, of reliability or, or um, SLA for uh, tier four data centers. Uh, tier four actually also includes redundancy for the uh, computers and storage and all of that. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that those data centers, they are not just hooked up to the, to the power outlet and you cross your fingers that nothing bad is going to happen. And the same would apply for an underwater data center such that you would have a backup power in form of a battery system that could carry this transition between uh, your power provider and whatever generators you have on site. About reliability, you're right, wind, wind is not constant. Even the, the tide generators, they are not constant either because you have different activities in water that could create fluctuations uh, and either go over or be slightly under. Um, but in, the, in this specific case of Project Natic, they had, uh, the reason why they went to Scotland is because that was right off the coast of uh, one of the, the biggest efforts into harnessing um, sustainable power. So they have lots of uh, tide generators, uh, uh, wind generators, solar, solar panels that are enough to generate power for the whole community in those islands, plus cover for the energy consumed by the, the data center underwater. So in essence, Yes, the, the idea would be to have data centers that rely on its own power and it's not connected to land other than through the fiber for networking or a backup power. But uh, that's the goal in the future. We can't do that, that right now, but the goal in the future is to be able to power the data center completely offshore and have it rely on just the, the networking access or a backup power. Does that answer your question, Harley? It does. So I was under the impression that, so pretty much in a sense, UPS plus the wind and tide generators would kind of re recreate the, the equivalent of what we have already. So in a sense, we could say one of those pods could be self-sustained. 
when it comes as soon as when it comes to power. But another that's thing that that's, that's the goal. The goal. Yeah. Because another thing that comes to mind is uh, internet connection. How do they transmit their data? Uh, so they have uh, sea cables coming from the shore. The same way that we have sea cables crossing the Atlantic to carry internet across that somewhat large pond, um, we would do that to carry internet at a much shorter distance from shore to the pod. So it's not it's not a huge challenge. It's something that uh, there are companies out there that are used to overcome challenges much bigger than this. Uh, we're talking about a few miles of fiber with a few miles of uh, a power cable that is specifically designed for for underwater op operation. They're they're um, they're armored to uh, prevent problems with sharks and other sea life. Uh, and accidents with uh, um, anchors and, and, and other things that can happen uh, in, in, the, in the undersea, uh, underwater uh, uh, soil uh, to prevent interruption. But that's essentially what they did. So they connected power and fiber from the shore all the way to this uh, data center. And that's pretty much how they powered it. Oh, and actually, thinking uh, I had forgot the fact that internet's pretty much run with the huge cables going undersea. So, if you think about it that way, it, might, it makes even more sense because, in a sense, it's closer than than it would normally be. Yeah, uh, it, this is not this is not weird or uncommon. It's it, there are many companies that manage those cables, that repair those cables, lay extra cables on a on a regular basis. So, there's there's a whole industry around it. So another point that I wanted to touch on, um, I don't think we got around to mentioning yet, is the security on a data center. Because if you look at Google, if you look at AWS, um, one of their key points is that they have security. Like you can't get anywhere near a computer without going like through 15 different barriers. And something like this just floating around in the ocean, um, what kind of system would it require to to operate securely, like what what stops someone from just going out there with a really big boat and just taking one of these or a couple of these and just going away? It's a good point. I, I think that nothing prevents them from doing this except that this is an incredibly expensive operation and that you need to have knowledge of where this data center is. It's, it's not floating, it's sunk 200 meters down. So you would need to search for it if you don't know the exact location. And I don't think that uh, if this comes true and we start having data centers uh, deployed underwater, that people are going to be sharing the exact location of them freely. Uh, it's true even with uh, data centers today. So if you go to an Amazon AWS data center, it's not marked outside with the Amazon logo with the smile and everything is just another huge warehouse that you're going to see somewhere. And there is no way that you can make it out and understand that this is Amazon's uh, uh, data center. They're all known script. Same with Google, same with Microsoft. They all have the same approach because of security. So assuming that someone uh, went on a, a treasure hunt and came across one of these pods and they happen to have the huge boat that's required to leverage something, something like this from the bottom of the ocean, then as soon as it's shut down to move it away, Microsoft would definitely know. Assuming that also they don't have any kind of sensors and monitors to detect movement of the pod. And then you're, you're stuck with a big thing on a slow boat moving around when uh, search parties start with helicopters and airplanes to spot you. So you're not going very far with, with something like that. It's not gonna be a very fruitful uh, heist. Well, on top of that, I'm assuming the data is all encrypted. So the only thing that pirates supposedly, pirate, data pirates, let's call them, could want with this is to require um, uh, a price in exchange for it. But Google can just have multiple copies of this data and therefore they don't care about it and 
they would just be wasting a lot of time attempting this in a sense. You could have like a self-destruct mechanism. If it moves, then you dump water into the container, ruining everything. Um, it's a crazy idea, but um, I think that, you know, it's, it's very hard for you to find it economically feasible to try to steal a container of that size, of that proportion, and thinking that you're going to get away with it. It's, it's, um, I don't think it's, it's something in the realm of reality, not today and not in the future, unless you have a very special interest in that specific pod because of some very important data that you're aware that happens to sit there, which it's, you know, just compounding complexity and, um, unlikelihood of events um, that you're going to come across one, know what's inside and figure that it's worthwhile the risk and you can pull it off without no one seeing. And when it comes to physical access saying, okay, someone is just trying to get inside uh, or getting access because they know where it is, then there is two ways of doing that. And first obvious, not so obvious way would be to have a diver come down and and try to enter the facility. First thing that I want to say is that if it tries to do that, then everything is going to be ruined because water is not supposed to come inside and it's going to destroy everything. Um, the second thing is that even if it doesn't care, the pod, the, the, the tube is made in such a way that the human being cannot be inside and pull a server out. You really need to take the whole racks out at once in order to service the servers. So there is no way that you can do that underwater. And then the second way um, would be for you to tap into the fiber. The moment you cut the fiber in, in order to tap, they're going to detect the cut. And then someone is going to start to probe around it if the connection returns, which most likely won't because you're going to be trying to recover a, a cut fiber underwater. And I, I'm not sure if we have technology for that. Um, then they're going to suspect that there is a, someone in the middle listening to it. And if you manage to do all of that, all of those communications are likely encrypted. So you still have another barrier to overcome in order to make any use of this uh, uh, information that you're listening on the wire after all of this effort. So I think it's pretty safe. It's not, the, the most of the safety that we have on data centers right now is in the form of uh, people access. Of course, they take care of cybersecurity and all of that, and they, they try to protect everything, but the, uh, the six layers of security that Google touts on their, their data centers is all about people access. It's like people uh, coming up to the gate uh, with, with an appointment and having a badge already and then going through the reception and registering and then going through the men traps. And then, you know, they have all of these levels and all of them are supposed to protect against people walking in. And by definition, you can not walk into a facility when it's underwater. So there are lots of other barriers that come before that and perhaps even more levels than just six. What about not stealing, but purposely attacking and creating some damage to the, to the spots? That's feasible. I mean, if, if I wanted to, and it's much easier than, than uh, most people would have guessed. Um, if you really have the intent of harming Microsoft and Amazon and you happen to know where the cables are landing, then it's just a matter of severing the cables on land and you're going to terminate the data center offshore. Um, uh, it's just not going to be able to communicate. It's not going to have enough power. It's going to slowly die and it's going to be a massive damage for them because they're going to have to recover those cables before they can get back to the pod likelihood. They're going to have to float the pod again to restart it. I don't know what the process would look like, but that's kind of, uh, easy if you know where the landings are and if they're unprotected, it's much easier than trying to mess around with the pod. Uh, in the sea. 
One thing that comes to mind, data centers are just a bunch of computers that parts that may break. You may have to replace things. You may have to service them at some frequency. How would servicing look like when you have this thing 200 meters into the water offshore? How would you go about it? Do they have spare parts that, that are, you know, if one a whole rack burns, uh, it stops working, you have another one to, to back it up? How, how does that work? So Microsoft has designed uh, this uh, system to operate, have a, a life cycle of 20 years and 20 years for the structure, meaning the tube and the cooling systems, the, the power transformers, the UPS and all of that, that goes with the structure of the, maybe not the UPS, but everything that goes with the structure of the, of the data center and that they would resurface the data center every five years. So every five years, they would float the data center, move it to shore, take everything out, upgrade the hardware, and then put everything back in and sunk it back again on the same place using the same infrastructure, meaning the cables and the location and everything. Um, with that in mind, you know, you're going to have to assume that servers are going to fail. And those that fail, you're just going to have to assume as a loss, and they are lost for the remainder of the five-year period. You're not going to service it because it's not going to be worthwhile. But because you have a certain level of redundancy, it's not going to matter either. And on top of that, because two things happen. Because they're underwater, they don't have oxygen. Oxidation is... Uh, a lot less than what it would be if oxygen was present. Um, and they figured that they had eight times more reliability than a counterpart on land. Uh, so that makes for a reassurance that the, the, the amount of losses you're going to have in a five-year period is going to be much less than you would see on land, therefore worthwhile uh, the, the uh, effort. The second consequence of that is if you have a hardware that you bought today and you're not going to touch it for the next five years, then you can strike a deal with the manufacturer such that they can discount the warranty of the price. You're not going to have to keep any spare parts for your devices because you're never going to take it off before five years. And when you do, you're taking off not for an upgrade, but uh, uh, not for a replacement of those failures, but actually for a complete upgrade. You're going to overhaul everything. You're going to buy completely new hardware and put everything new back in and then sunk it again. So uh, it brings actually two advantages and there is no procedure designed uh, or process to replace faulty equipment. They're going to fa fail and they're going to just assume, take it as a loss and not worry about it for the period of five years. That's one of the features, right, that they mention is that in typical data centers, you have people going in. And when you have people going into the data center, besides like the whole fire thing, there's also like touching. So people bump into stuff, people uh, hit stuff, and that can really damage life cycles. If we're talking about a hard drive or pieces that move, we, we're talking about damage. And once you have that at the bottom of the ocean, it's not going anywhere. So you have way less, um, how do I say, depreciation on those the, on those equipments. Yeah, and uh, since we're 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 touching the the topic of, of fire, fire suppression in data centers is one of the the challenges that you have. It's mostly solved today, and it's something that. Um, you know, there are ways that you can solve it right, some ways that you can solve it really, really badly. Um, so using certain chemicals and water are bound to damage the servers in the environment. So in essence, you can have a fire triggered by one server that's going to be damaged. But now because you threw water, you damage the whole, the whole data center, right? So in order to avoid that, um, Fire suppression systems now, they come either with inert gas and some of these systems just use nitrogen. And um, other solutions actually remove oxygen from the environment. So they don't have an active uh, and a, a passive fire suppression system. Instead of having sprinklers and, and uh, dispersal nozzles for the, the chemicals to or the inert gases to suppress the fire, 
they just remove oxygen from the data center to a level comparable to what you would have at high altitudes. So human beings can still be around and work uh, on a daily basis and uh, survive and function, but at a level that is not enough for a fire to exist and sustain itself. So it's, it's, a, it's more expensive, but when you do this, you don't need the need for a passive system and sensors for fires. It's just not gonna happen. And it's, it's one more thing that you can eliminate from failure. It's not, if, if your sensor fail, fail in detecting a the fire, then it gets out of proportion. And now the, the suppression system cannot contain, for example. Uh, those are things that can fail. And when you have an active system like this, it's kind of like having your, your containers submerged and stripped out of oxygen. It's just not gonna happen because it's impossible to sustain fire without oxygen. Well, one thing that comes to mind as well is um, there certainly have been other attempts at creating um, data centers and setting up servers in other locations. An example would be an underground data center that solved, in a sense, that could solve two of the biggest problems, the temperature, because you're like underground and that lowers the temperature, you're not having to worry about the, the climate as much, and the space as well. Uh, how is uh, how is going underwater? Why, why, why are they trying underwater as opposed to something that might at first seem easier and seem to solve the similar, this, about the same problems? It's a good question. Um, so like one of the main things, I guess, is like uh, the refrigeration part. Like once you're underground, once you, you can't really go that deep um, without incurring a lot of costs to set it up. So I don't know if you know this, but in Europe, in a lot of bunkers, uh, people have turned transformed those bunkers into data centers. There are a couple of them. Um, even the guys from the Pirate Bay, the torrenting website, used to work on one of those. It shows up in their documentary. Um, but that doesn't deal with uh, the cooling part. So you can't just rely on atmospheric cooling in that case. So you do have to have air conditioning or some other kind of cooling solution in that scenario. You don't have that in the ocean. That's just one of the points that I see. Um, so... It's, it's counterintuitive, but uh, when you, the deeper you go on the ground, the hotter it gets. So uh, typically, of course, at a certain, a certain depth, in the beginning it goes down, but then it starts to increase. Uh, there are cooling systems that use that characteristic of the soil to cool uh, environments. So you would have coils that would run water at different depths and have the water go through uh, heat exchangers and condensers and come back and, and refrigerate the air. And it's, it's a similar solution that's used, but at a different scale uh, for the underwater solution. Uh, and it's more efficient too. It's just the, the heat exchange between soil and water, it's different. With, with water, it's a lot better because of convection, because of it's a liquid, it, you know, you can, uh, cool things off a lot faster than if you're just dealing with soil. The second problem that I can think of, it's really digging such a large structure that, you know, you, you, it would require in at, at the right depth and then creating those coils at the right uh, depth. So you, you actually reap the benefits of uh, this vast, vast amount of cooling that you need to tap into the soil. Um, it would be very expensive. And I, I think perhaps more expensive than just dunking this in water. Just, you know, because when, when it comes time to deploy, all it takes is really a boat that you rent for the service. And then it goes there and drops it. And then afterwards, you just come and pick it up. If it's the soil, you have to dig, bury. And then if you need to recover, then you dig and unbury. So I think it's a lot of work, a lot of real estate still and it might not be as efficient. Oh, so I guess it makes sense. Turns out that building that might my, my, my counter uh, argue, uh, my counterbalance the, the benefits as well of the cooling. And additionally, I was just realizing that uh, there's also humidity problems that uh, you'd have to deal with as well. well. I guess since you're dealing with that problem underwater, 
already, it wouldn't be a big deal uh, with the soil. It's already something that you would have to face uh, in the sea. But I think I think uh, in this particular case, if you're, you're if you're trying to be uh, operating at a scale, and and you're strictly thinking of time to deployment, I want solutions that I have a production line. I figure what I want, and I already have a company that provides me with the tubes. I have a company that provides me with the heat exchangers, with the the power transformers, with the UPSs. I have the racks lined up and all of those plans. And now it's a matter of figuring out the configuration of the servers that I want running inside those containers and the location. You can literally just have a line of production for those data centers where you know you just it can be even just in time with the parts coming in and you assembling everything together. And once the racks are ready, you just sh uh, stuff it into the tube, seal the tube, uh, come with a crane, move it to the boat, and the boat goes offshore and drops this. It's a it's a very simple process to operate at scale. Whereas if you're doing that with the soil, yes, you can still do the capsule and and automate a lot of that. But when it comes to excavating for the for the heat exchange, um, that's not something that you can put in a production line. It's just something that you're really going to have to dig and line out the pipes and make the exchange with the soil and then uh, bury everything. It's a lot of work. Still take time. You're still going to depend on permits, projects. It's going to depend on the on the soil composition and um, zoning issues. So it's, it's still going to be a lot more trouble than just dropping on water. Now I say dropping, that's not what they're doing. They're lowering all the way to the bottom of the sea and they try to find a, a pretty flat place to to put this on. You don't want this to be on, you know, sideways or on an incline and, and risking a drop or or movement over time. Well, it turns out, yeah, that's clearly a better solution. You definitely give, gave me enough reasons to, to understand why. Uh, one thing that comes up though, uh, Who's paying for the real estate? If you're just putting it offshore, just dumping these servers, lowering the servers to the sea, setting up your data centers, who's paying for that area? Or is no one paying? If no one's paying, once these things go scale, uh, I'm assuming at some point, since the government's going to have to start organizing who's putting servers where at some point, I believe. What do you guys, what do you think about that, Adriano? It's a good question. I'm thinking, I... I those areas, they're probably ownership of the state or the country. Um, and if you're going to put something there, it's probably going to be like an oil rig. Um, if you want to have a, a, a sea rig for oil extraction, then you have to deal with the government to figure out where it's going to be. Uh, figure out zoning and excavation and, and figure out the uh, environmental concerns. So you probably have to deal with the government of that area. If it's international waters, then I think nobody. You just drop it there and that's it. Um, but I think if you're offshore within the, the, the sea limits of that country, then you have to deal with the government of that country or the state that covers that area. And then you rent from them, it's probably gonna be much cheaper than renting um, real estate on land. It's it's not something that you, you have to compete with a lot of people to get uh, space for. Um, so that's my guess. I'm not sure, but that's that, that would be my guess. If I were to guess, I would most definitely say it would be cheaper for sure. Yeah, that's and then besides, there's plenty of space. It wouldn't be a problem, even if they if there were to be some charge. Um. You know, and and you know, this is a trend. People are in dire needs of uh, processing power with artificial intelligence. Um, you know, the internet alone brought us the the cloud infrastructure. And the demand there is seemingly infinite. Um, there is there is no amount of data centers that seems to uh, be enough for all of those startups and all of those companies and all the users 
joining the internet and using them daily to solve all of those problems that they have on a daily basis to, uh, through their smartphones, computers, uh, at work. So there is a lot of computing needs in the, in the whole world. And uh, the solutions that we have right now, they are very expensive and they're slow moving. It takes 18 to 24 months to build a data center. It's, it's a structure that is very costly to build, maintain, and, um, uh, and uh, upgrade and renovate. It's extremely expensive. Um, and you know, with this growing need, we've been seeing lots of very creative solutions. Um, started, I think, uh, in some way with cryptocurrency miners. So these people rushed out to uh, buy uh, processing power through GPUs or through ASICs, uh, which are uh, ships designed specifically for mining certain coins. And those computers, they generate a lot of heat. And it's more heat than your typical server. Uh, sometimes a single uh, mining unit will consume up to 10 times the, the typical power of a server. And they started running into these issues of, okay, where are we going to run this? Um, one of the creative solutions that um, you might have guessed already was, okay, let's open up data centers in Iceland. So you just build a data center, put a fan, filters, and suck air from the outside, goes through the servers, cool everything off, and I don't have to pay for an AC system. I don't have to do maintenance on the AC system. And I don't need to uh, spend all the amount of money that I would have spent powering that AC system. Um, and there is this huge amount of supercomputers now being deployed north of uh, the globe where they're trying to harness all of that cool air to save on power and cooling. Also, land up there is relatively cheap. But then you run into the downsides of distance. So latency and you know getting a hold of quality uh, connection to the you know a backbone, it's going to be hard or very expensive. But because there is this movement, there is infrastructure following it. Um, so we see um, a lot of people are now trying to think of ways to make this sustainable, make this easy to deploy, and make it as cheap as possible. And this is just one way. On its face, it seems more expensive. Um, I'm glad that Microsoft is picking up the bill with the research. Um, and I think that more are following, there is this company um, called Nautilus Data uh, Data Systems, I think, or Data Technologies, and they um, created this barge that is a data center and operates offshore. It's it's actually uh, docked in a in a in a port, uh, and you would have access to it. It's more like a data center than anything else, but we're starting to see these concerns with cooling, these concerns with real estate, concerns with mobility, um, and, and C is just one of these crazy solutions that we're starting to see. And I think it's not gonna stop there. Well, yeah, that's, that, seems very, uh, that seems very ridiculous to think that they're setting up servers and at the poles and, you know, where it's very cold and underwater. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, so assuming these things start, you know, Microsoft's researching, it's finding out the, the difficult parts, the science uh, side of things. And once these things start scaling, I imagine one of two things is likely to happen. We're either gonna have a very large structure for a single unit, let's say, equivalent to a data center, or we're gonna have a modular design where we're able to stack more, 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 more pods and, and make a sort of a, a modular situation where you can pull one off, uh, service it, and then pull the, the another one off and service it, and so on. Uh, these things would most definitely be hard to do on on land. How difficult would we would it be for us to put together these structures, power them up under sea? In a sense, that seems to be very difficult. And it may seem that we might need all sorts of uh, mechanical arms and things to go underneath and like stack them up in a sense. 
uh, that seems to me like it could be a difficult thing. What do you, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on that, Adriano? Um, so remember, I told you guys that this was actually the second phase of Project Natic with uh, Microsoft. The first phase, they sunk a smaller tube, different format, uh, less servers, different technology at a at a sh in shallower uh, waters off the Pacific coast. And um, now they had this large scale, 800 plus servers, um, 200 meters deep in water, and now they just recovered it. Phase three, it's going to be a docking station, which is essentially just a, a structure with ballasts that you can use to float and sink the whole structure. And you have 12 of those uh, tubes on top of this structure. So essentially you have this uh, structure operating as a barge when the ballasts are filled with air, you mount by, by your, uh, at the harbor, you mount all of those tubes on top of the, of the, this, this docking system, this barge, and then you wire everything and you tug it all the way to where it's supposed to be. And then you open the ballast sinking the the whole structure and then assuming that this is already connected it just rests in place and now you have a complete data center running underwater in this structure when time comes that now you want to float this you just inject air into the ballast and then the data center center comes back to the surface you don't even need a, blo a boat to to bring it back up and you just tug it back to harbor Reservice the the tubes and the, the the servers inside. Do the reverse and bring it back to to water. Yeah, the floating strategy seems quite simple. Actually, you should think about it that way. You know, no no needed uh, fancy equipment in a sense. Pretty much just have it flow back up like a submarine in a sense. You could think of it that way. Makes sense. Yeah, and and and. You can have a tugboat, just, just tow it back and forth. This is very easy, very cheap. And it's it's something that is unlikely to, to cause any issues. Um, so you don't need a, now a specialized boat or a provider to, to help you with deployment of those data centers. So um, hopefully the, this, they're gonna be successful with this experiment as well. And I think this is going to be a key phase. Um, when, you, when you can eliminate all of that huge infrastructure uh, that involves with a boat of that shape, size, and with all of those requirements, um, you start to make things very easy. Now you can service this from any harbor, um, with, you know, most harbors, and, um, you know, most, most big centers and, and places where uh, you would operate from, it, it, it would be much easier for you to uh, find the infrastructure that you need for this work. Do you guys think this will lead to a more, uh, a different wave of software, not software, sorry, hardware, specialized hardware for these kinds of data centers? Like people design hardware today to put in regular data centers where we're exposed to oxygen and all that kind of stuff. But if this becomes a trend and really picks up, do you think we'll start seeing a differentiation between hardware? Like sometimes NVIDIA might come out with a new GPU that's like, hey, you can only run this under the sea, basically. I don't think so, because uh, that would seem it'd be cheaper to just make the undersea environment like the, the surface environment like we do, as opposed to do research into developing a PCB that's that's more resistant or something because it doesn't have to wor worry about oxygen, especially because at some point you're gonna have to bring the pod up and service it. So it can't, it can't, it has to have some defense against uh, oxygen in a sense. Also, once, when, when, let's say you're, you're putting together the pod, you buy the equipment, you, you prepare it in a regular scenario that, that has oxygen in, the, in it, so in a sense, eventually it will be exposed to oxygen. So I think you're better off just making regular equipment as opposed to try and then pick up the bill on the research you'd need to change it up. That's how I see it. What, what do you think about this, Fernando? 
Mm, well, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, it would lead a lot of research would be needed, but maybe they could find some ways to to create equipments that um, can run faster without worrying about what they need to to worry when it's mm, with oxygen and stuff like that. So, but as you said, the research they they would have to pay. And I don't think it would happen before a lot of these servers would be deployed. Like they would have, they would need a, to someone to sell that. And it would possibly happen only after it's, it's very widespread. I think, I think Nathan's question was assuming that now it's uh, mainstream and lots yeah. of people are, are buying those. That yes. Microsoft came out with an order of like 50,000 of these units. I'm pretty sure any computer manufacturer would be happy to do research in that scenario because yeah, there's a lot true. of money to be made. So I here's agree. what drives a differentiation is if there is something that is currently done today that makes them more expensive, and uh, it's unnecessary when you're in an oxygen-free environment or when you manage to have the cooling parameters that you see underwater, that's when it would make sense to me that you know, they would do different hardware to draw prices or to make them specific for this kind of application. But uh, in the beginning of this call, I already told you guys that this hardware by default is gonna be cheaper because it's not meant to be replaced so you're, you're already getting cheaper because it doesn't have warranty. So in a sense, you already have that. As soon as, as long as Microsoft is dealing with the manufacturer and they're striking deals with them, they're saying, hey, we're not gonna, we don't want warranty on this. What kind of discount can you offer me? You are already getting hardware that is specifically designed for underwater application and it's cheaper. So um, it's definitely gonna happen. Uh, it's one of the things that they're aiming for. And I'm not sure what kinds of savings we're talking about, but I can see a future in which this is mainstream. And when you're trying to acquire components, you're gonna have your seller asking you, hey, is this for underwater or land use? And they are gonna add in or remove the cost of warranty. So that's what I can think as far as now, I'm not sure what else they're gonna learn. Say they figure that instead of using uh, exchangers to cool the air, they're going to go with a, a water cooler solution and it's a different technology than we use in land for some reason, then yes, maybe, maybe they're going to come up with different hardware that may or may not be cheaper for that kind of application. But right now, warranty is already one piece that makes it cheaper. Are there are you guys aware of any other major players participating in the research? Because uh, I've heard of Microsoft doing some testing, but I'd, I'd, I have a hard time thinking if uh, because this seems to be uh, the future in some ways that no other major um, company like Google or any other Chinese company uh, out there. I mean, Google's not Chinese, but other Chinese companies as well could be interested in, in partaking in this research. It's Japan, for example, since they're like a tiny little country and they have plen plenty of water, maybe they could be interested in researching. So you guys know of anyone else who's interested or is this just a Microsoft situation? Oh, I personally, I don't know of any other company, um, but it, it would surprise me if Amazon and Google have not at least looked into this in the past and that they're not following this very close because it's, it's, very close to their interests. It's something that they're definitely going to want to leverage if they have the possibility. So they're probably going to start partnering or start their own research pro uh, projects to see how they could bring this to their own data centers. But I'm not aware of any other one right now operating under the same assumption that you know, you're going to operate underwater in a tube and with, with the, the same characteristics of uh, Project Natic. You guys know of uh, any other products, Nathan, Fernando? No, like no, I know of a couple know. of weird servers that there are like around the world, like the the one on Sealand is one that WikiLeaks used a while ago. I think they're still using it. Like, do you guys know about Sealand? You guys ever heard of it? No, never no. heard of it. So there's this oil rig up in the 
north of England, Britain right there, um, and it was abandoned. And then somebody took over and declared it as a sovereign country called the Principality of Sealand. And it's like this abandoned fortress, and um, they put a data center up there. Um, so it's, it's not subject to like any government and basically it's just a data center out there in the middle of the ocean, but it's up on land. So it's interesting because if it's not subject to, to any nation and say that now you have this data center containing, I don't know, uh, data from terrorists or data that, you know, it's of interest of other countries. WikiLeaks, for example, they put all their stuff there. Right. So a nation is supposed to defend itself. Otherwise, any other nation can just walk right in and take the servers and who's going to care? Who's going to do anything about it? So this is, in a sense, seems on its face, it seems, wow, these guys hacked the system. I think they're setting them up for huge failure if someone really takes interest into taking their data center and uh, getting access to that data. Um, or they need to have a small army to defend that that uh, fort. I don't know. It's just it's a like crazy in thought. A sense, but... In a sense, it's hard to take the data because like Harley mentioned in the beginning, it's probably all encrypted. So the most that they would get out of it is just a bunch of noise um, and probably put strain on the people operating Sealand and also on WikiLeaks, making them move somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like, are they bothering a co a country enough so that they'll go out there and do that and risk pissing off England, risk pissing off all that other kind of stuff? Because even though it's off. not the same government, but I don't know, you're gonna have to either like set up an agreement or a treaty or something to like let them come through. I don't know. It may so, it may upset in the sense that people are you know, uh, thinking you should not have messed up with WikiLeaks, but it goes as far as that. There is no national interest from Britain, I assume, on that fortress. Unless there is, you know, it, it messes up with data from British government or stuff that they, they put up there. I don't see how this, this could happen. Like, it's pretty close to England. Like, uh, from reading right here, it says it's seven miles off the eastern shore. So it's pretty close. Like it's far enough that it's in international waters, but it's it's close enough that it might be like, hey, you're a little bit too close to home. Is it is it set up I on an island? I, I missed that part. Is, is, it, is it an island? Isn't it no, like it a structure in stilts? Yeah, it's like two big massive concrete pillars in the middle of the ocean <laughs> with a house on top, like a really big structure on top. Okay. That sounds insane. Yeah, I, after you started talking about it, I remembered the uh, story of Sealand. Um, and um, I don't know, it just feels to me that this is one of these crazy ideas of trying to liberate the internet and, and hack the system. Um, my idea is that uh, if, if nations have enough interest, they're in trouble. It's, it's going to be very hard for them to defend that data. Anything else, guys, that we can uh, talk about this cloud going to the sea? So, like, another kind of concern that I have was what would a disaster scenario look like for one of these? Like, I know you wouldn't put one in, like, the Louisiana Bayou because of all the hurricanes, but let's say you put one somewhere. You're not dealing with tornadoes. You're not dealing with all those kinds of stuff, but natural disasters do occur. What would something – this would spell, like, complete – disaster for something like this because they have basically no protection out there yeah so so the landings are particularly vulnerable like i said i mean you're underwater and you think you're vulnerable to hurricanes but then there is a, a particularly strong hurricane and then you have a surge and your landings and the structure that takes care of your landings are underwater now you don't have access to your data center anymore um so in a sense, you're covered for to some extent, but depending on the, the natural disaster, if it affects your landings then or the connectivity you have, then you're in trouble all the same. Plus, you're not going to be able to immediately access the, the data center depending on, on 
uh, the the weather situation or how how things are progressing around that area. So this this may turn out that waters are going to recede, and now you're going to have to take care of the lennies, and then be able to reach to your data center and restart it if if you know such operation is needed to restart once uh, connectivity is broken. I'm not sure if that's the case. So I, I think yes, it's it's it helps with avoiding disasters, but not completely. There is a very vulnerable part there. Guys, we're we're at. Uh, the, uh, the turn of the hour now. Uh, thank you so much for uh, watching our discussion. We think that this really is the future, um, at least uh, to some applications. We're definitely going to start seeing this uh, kind of data center. Uh, Microsoft seems to be very committed to this technology. The results so far that they managed to gather from this uh, experiment are very positive. Um, and if they can figure out a way to build this, in uh, economical fashion, it is definitely the future for lots of companies looking to deploy data centers in a fast and affordable manner. Um, thank you again. Thanks, guys, and see you all. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.